We welcome you to the official Titans podcast presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. I'm Mike Keith with Amy Wells. Amy, great to have you again. Hey, Mike. How are you? I am super, and I'm so thrilled to have this guy on the OTP. I love Tank Williams, former Titan <laughs> safety, draft pick in 2002, number 25 himself, Tank Williams. Welcome to the official Titans podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, I expected to be on this podcast maybe two or three years ago, so finally oh. I made it. I finally made it. <laughs> Farm Bureau of Health Plants is now our sponsor, and now we've got Tank Williams, so we've got it completed now. <laughs> it's taken us two years to get two important things done, but I'm glad it's happening. Now, you're in California? Yeah, yeah, California. I've been uh, sheltering in place for about a month and a half now, so... Spending most of my time doing home workouts, Peloton, going on long walks, just trying to keep my distance. But everything's well. Family's good. So no complaints. You look great. When you played for the Titans, you weighed 225-ish. What about now? I was listed in the books at 225-ish, <laughs> but I was more like 235-ish. <laughs> I thought That's what I thought. <laughs> right now, I'm in like the 215 range since wow. I've been living out here in California. I try to eat clean, work out regularly. So if I can keep that weight off, that's half the battle. So I, I do what I can. I do what I can. Now, you're doing lots of things, but one of the things that you're doing is you're working for Yahoo Sports. Tell the OT people exactly what you're doing for Yahoo. So when I first started off with Yahoo Sports, it was just as a fantasy football analyst in 2015. And then my job description has just progressed over the years to where now I cover uh, fantasy, NFL, and college football. And so I'm prepping just like everyone else for the draft that's coming Thursday. So excited to see these picks roll off. I mean, this is a strange time. I mean, it's going to be a draft that none of us has ever seen before with everything happening remotely. Uh, but uh, looking forward to it nonetheless. Now, how did you make that transition from being the fantasy football analyst to now being a draft analyst? With fantasy football, you have to be in tune with the entire roster, regardless of just focusing on maybe like the top one or two on the depth chart. And so just having that knowledge and also covering college football for Yahoo Sports, where I'm covering all the premium games on Saturdays and stuff. So you just get to learn all those players. And so then it kind of lends itself to draft players because you are already knowledgeable about the rosters and what teams are trying to do. And then at the same time, you have this good understanding of the players that are coming in and then you're just trying to put all the pieces together. So that's the fun part about it. So who taught you how to analyze these players almost like you're a scout? I think it's just from playing the game. I mean, you know, you get drafted and you get to see some of the players that you play with, whether it's like a Keith Bullock or a Samara Roll or Steve McNair, Eddie George, and then it's just having these data points of good players that you play with and then seeing some of those traits in other guys and saying like, okay, yeah, he could probably do some of the same things that this player did. And this scheme is pretty much the same. So therefore, I think he'll be a good fit for this particular defense, whether it's 3-4, 4-3. You just kind of go along the lines that way with in regards to different teams. Tank, you were the 45th pick in the 2002 NFL draft. 6'2", 225, or at least that's how you were listed, 6'2", right. 225. <laughs> Knowing your size and your skill set, move Tank Williams from 2002 to 2020. Where would you go in this draft with how the game is played today? And I look at Isaiah Simmons, and I, I, I feel like he's a player that's built and molded kind of similar to myself. Like when I describe Isaiah Simmons, I say he's probably a blend between Keith Bullock and myself because Bull was a little bit larger but Isaiah runs like a cornerback. I mean, he's faster than what I timed. I timed in the low four fours, but he timed in at like a four three something. I mean, so having that speed, that ability to play up close on the line, linebacker, and also play safety too, cover people in the slot. I mean, he's one of those versatile players uh, that's perfect for the lead today because you have these running backs like Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara that are so explosive out the backfield. And at the same time, you need somebody that can cover like a George Kittle or a John New Smith or something like that. So Having that position flexibility at a guy like that, I mean, it's premium in the league, and that's why you probably see a guy like Isaiah Simmons go really high on Thursday. Would you have been a linebacker? Would a team have made you a linebacker today rather than play you at safety? I think so. And one of the interesting nuggets, I can't remember what coach it was, but I remember when I came out my draft class, whoever was the coach who I believe the Detroit Lions, he said that he wanted to draft me and move me to cornerback 
my first year because I was fast enough to play corner. And so just kind of refine my skill sets as a corner and then be able to move me all over the field because then I'd be comfortable playing in the slot at linebacker and everything else. And I thought that was pretty unique. And as you see the way that the game is changing now, where all these guys are, they're not just position specific. They were to play all over the field like a Swiss Army knife. I feel like, you know, that's something that I would have really appreciated doing back in those days. Now, you're good friends with Keith Bullock, and we have had this conversation a lot, so I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Keith Bullock is convinced that if he were drafted in 2020, he would go higher than 30th overall. He is sure of it, that his type of game is better suited for the way football is played in 2020. Yeah. Do you agree with that? I think so, because I feel like it's a more of a pass centric league these days. And so I feel like the skill set is similar to what Isaiah Simmons has. Like obviously Bull can't run the way that Isaiah Simmons can, but the one thing that he always prided himself on was being a playmaker and he was really smart. So he was always around the ball. And that's how the game was really transitioned. Like I was more of like a thumper at safety. So I was going in trying to lay the big hits, but now the game is about creating turnovers, whether it's strip sacks, tip balls that lead to interceptions, pick sixes, getting the ball in the end zone on defense. That's what the game is predicated on. And that's why they call my man Mr. Monday Night because he used to do that (laughs) on the regular. (laughs) You have said Isaiah Simmons' name now like 10 times. Is is he the best football player in this draft, regardless of position? Nah, that goes to Chase Young. Chase Young is a Like Isaiah Simmons is like an athlete. He's a physical freak. I call him Rick James and cleats. He's a super freak. <laughs> <laughs> but but like Chase Young, man. And when you look at his stats, I mean, he was a productive guy like his three years at Ohio State. But what impressed me the most is that he had the most sacks the year after Nick Bosa leaves. And you would think that he would be more productive with Nick Bosa there. But then he was able to, you know, kind of build on top of what he did that season before and then just become even more of a monster this year. So the only reason he's not going first is because the Cincinnati Bengals need a quarterback and Joe Burrow is that dude. Otherwise, Chase Young would be the first pick off the board. And talent-wise, he probably should be. Wow. What is your favorite position on the defensive side of the ball to analyze? I mean, obviously, I'm a defensive back, so I like seeing the safeties. I like seeing what they're reading and how they're effective in the run and pass game. I love watching cornerbacks because – I really wasn't that good at man-to-man coverage when I was coming into the league. I really learned how to play man coverage from watching Samara Rowe in the film room. And so just watching these cornerback techniques, like seeing what they're seeing at the line of scrimmage and how seamlessly they can transition from zone and man coverage and coming up in the run and playing back deep. And so I've always found that intriguing. And then obviously I just love watching the edge rushers too. I was fortunate enough to play with Dwight Freeney at the senior bowl going into my rookie year and seeing that dude put spin move after spin move on people. And I was like, this dude's going to be special. And then to see how, like how the game has transitioned now to whenever you can find a guy like Franey, he's going to be one of the first guys off the board, which is why, you know, Chase Young is going to go as high as he will this year. What is maybe the top one or two skills that a corner has to have to be successful in today's NFL? I think you have to be smart and I think you have to be fast. When you're in college, you always have this mindset that you're about to go to the NFL, you're about to go play against these big, strong men. But I remember, you know, being a junior, senior in college, and John Lynch came back to Stanford because they always have the NFL guys come back. And he was like, I can tell you one thing. Like, it's important to be strong, but speed is the key to the game. And that's one thing that hasn't changed from 2002 to now 2020. If you can run and if you're a smart player that doesn't bust assignments where the coaches will depend on you being where you're supposed to be, on every single play, and then at the same time you're making plays, then there's going to be a place for you in the NFL for a long time. Is it more important for corners to tackle today than it was in 2002 or less important? <laughs> I don't even know if they tackle today. I mean, I don't want to get the current guys mad at me, but, I mean, the way that tackling is going in the current NFL is just – ridiculous like I almost call it the flag football league these days because you can't touch anyone and trust me I understand I'm not hating because I believe the changes that they've made in the rules have made it to where people can have longer careers and that's better for the players that's better for the teams that's better for their families but at the same time I mean the tackling is just atrocious these guys act like they don't want to touch the guy on the other side of the ball and yeah it's, it's, it's just a sad state right now it's a sad state in the game where tackling is but As you've seen, I mean, the teams that play defense nowadays are the teams that end up 
you know, making it far in the playoffs. It's a game that's predicated on moving the ball on offense, creating matchups where it's in the middle of the field, on the outside of the field, but still defense wins championships. And we continue to see that on a regular basis once you get in the thick of the playoffs. Tank Williams, who are the corners that you really like in the 2020 NFL draft? Who jumps out to you? I mean, obviously the first corner that's going to come off the board is Jeff Okuda. I mean, he has the right size. He has the right speed. He has the right university. I mean, whenever you hear a cornerback coming out of the Ohio State University, you just know <laughs> he's going to be a hot pick. And he lives up to the bill. And I mean, he's a really smart player. He's confident. He has really good feet. He's smooth. He makes plays on the ball. And I think he's just going to be a perfect fit. I mean, I see him going to Detroit. I mean, it seems like that's the place where he's going to land. Then they have, they have a need for him. And he prides himself on trying to be similar to like these Stephon Gilmore type players where they're real c- cerebral with understanding not only the defense, but what the offense trying to do to them and making sure they're going to be in the best position to make plays. And I, mean, I just feel like he's a really special player and he has the right attitude, the right moxie to be successful at the next level. I know that the Titans are probably going to look for some corners late in the draft. Jeff Okuda won't be there. Trust no. me, but there may be some guys that can fit the Titans' needs as you get later on in the first round if they decide to stay there. All right, before Amy asks her next question, I need to remind everybody, you're watching the official Titans podcast and listening to the official Titans podcast brought to you by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Look to the folks at Farm Bureau Health Plans when you need someone who understands the X's and O's of healthcare coverage. They've been protecting Tennesseans since 1947. Good job, Mike. That sounded great. Thank you. <laughs> Mike always sounds great. <laughs> and Mike always sounds great. All right, Tank, I want to ask you, what are safeties of today asked to do that you were not asked to do? Ooh. I would say that teams were a little bit more run heavy during my, during my day where they played a little bit more 21 personnel where you have two backs. So you have a running back, fullback, a tight end, two wide receivers. So in those formations, you know, teams were a little bit more downhill run centric. Whereas today, I mean, the, you know, the predominant formation that they use is 11 personnel where you have one running back, one tight end, three wide receivers, or they just split out with four wide receivers. So the safeties have to be able to come down and play a little bit more coverage in the slot or have the speed and the range to play over the top. Like I was able to do that. I was a little bit unique where I was a big guy who could run like a corner. So I was able to do that. But at the same time, I feel like these safeties these days need to be able to play more like a nickel versus like being a big safety that's primarily on like tight ends and bigger people running routes. Do you think that a safety will go in the first round on Thursday night? I actually have a mock draft where I do not have a safety going in the first round. I feel like they have some really good players at the safety position. At the same time, I feel like this is a really unique draft where the top of the draft are like the caliber players that you're accustomed to seeing coming off the board early. And then once you get to that middle range, I feel like teams, if they can't trade back, they're going to pick some players who are really good, but I mean, it's just guys where they just kind of feel in knees and no one that just kind of really jumps off the board like we've seen in prior drafts. And even though they have some teams that need safeties like the Cowboys and some of these other ones, I feel like they'll probably go for a player that's rated a little bit higher versus just picking need right there. At least that's what I would do. So that's why I don't have any safeties going in the first round, even though I do have one position that normally doesn't go in the first round these days at running back. I have, I have at least one going in the first round. Who? <laughs> man, my favorite running back is the guy from Wisconsin, man. Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor. He's a beast. I said that he is Saquon Barkley on the rocks. So he's just slightly <laughs> watered down. He's not as fast as Saquon. He didn't really show like the pass catching ability at Wisconsin because they don't do that at Wisconsin, but he showed that he can do that at the combine. The dude is fast, powerful, smart, has the right attitude, moxie, and I I think that dude is really good. To me, he's the best all around back in the draft. Wow, so you like him better than DeAndre Swift from Georgia and J.K. Dobbins from Ohio State. I mean, that's just my personal preference. I mean, both of those guys are really good backs, really good athletes, and when I talk to J.K. Dobbins, I mean, he really, hit the nail on the head. I mean, he doesn't have that prototypical size of what we see as a running back these days, but he miles himself after Christian McCaffrey, where it's a guy that may be built a little bit smaller, but at the same time can be effective in the run and pass game. And so McCaffrey showed that he can hold up to having a lot of touches. And so I feel like Davis and some of those other guys want to prove that they can as well. But 
the way the draft was falling to me into where I felt like a running back may come off the board and the team that I have him going to, I felt like, you know, Jonathan Taylor would probably be the best fit there. Interesting. Okay, so you've said Chase Young is your number one defensive player. Is Joe Burrow your number one offensive player regardless of position, or do you have somebody else? I mean, just because of the emphasis that we put on quarterbacks these days, because quarterbacks make your team, make your offense go, I feel like Joe Burrow is the best and safest play at the quarterback position in this draft. I mean, I understand that some people may call him a one-year wonder. I mean, he really didn't get the opportunity to show what he could at Ohio State. But what impressed me the most is that I had the opportunity to talk to him at the combine. And he was able to kind of talk through the scenario of being a guy in high school who was a really good player, got to go to Ohio State. You don't just get, you know, scholarships to Ohio State just being okay. Like, you have to be pretty good. Yet not getting his time to shine there. Going to LSU, having some doubts about the player that he was. So he had to, like, basically kind of relearn the fact that, hey, I'm a dude that can play ball at the college football level while at the same time earning the respect of the guys in the locker room. And then after doing that, making plays of them like, yo, I can take my game up to another level. And he was able to do that and win the Heisman. I mean, he reminds me so much, and you hear it a lot already, but like of Tom Brady, just that chip that he has on his shoulder. But then also the way that he makes his reads, the way he maneuvers in the pocket, he reminds me of Brady. But at the same time, he's a way better athlete. And so given the fact that he's mobile, he's really accurate, and just the drive and the determination that he plays with to be better each and every day. That's why I feel like he's the best offensive player in this draft class. Who's the player in this draft that's going to be the biggest surprise? Or who's your big sleeper? I don't know if my guy's a big sleeper, but I know there's a lot of questions around who's the best wide receiver in this draft class. You hear a lot of talk about C.D. Lamb, Jerry Judy, Ruggs, T. Higgins, some of these other guys, but... I don't know if it's just bias based on the guys I played against during my playing day, but C.D. Lamb reminds me of Marvin Harrison. Like, he's not the biggest guy out there, but he's super fast, makes every route look the same, makes the difficult catches. He was able to put up big stats, even though teams were focusing in on him. Like, everyone knew he was the guy, knew he was going to get the ball. He produced with Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, and Jalen Hurts with all those three quarterbacks providing, like, different – you know, attributes for those various years. And so I feel like C.D. Lamb, to me, is the best wide receiver in the draft. And I can understand why some guys may have them ranked a little bit differently, but I expect him to be a productive player from the start. All right, Tank, we're taking it straight to the pros here. Who do you think the Tennessee Titans will take at number 29? Just yell it out. All right, so in my mock draft, I have the Titans going with Ross Blacklock, a DT from TCU. And the reason I have them going with him is because We're not sure how the Jadeveon Clowney thing is going to shake out right now. And when I'm kind of stack ranking those guys who can be like a past productive DN versus the cornerbacks, I feel like Blacklock is a higher caliber player than some of the cornerbacks that are rated right there. And that they may be able to just pick one of those cornerbacks up a little bit later in the uh, draft. And so I have Blacklock going at 29 to my Titans. So that's important. But, But let me hit the thing that's really important. I want you to give me a player in this draft who can make a play like Tank Williams did as a rookie on November 3rd, 2002 in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the old RCA Dome where, if I remember correctly, I think he blindside blitzed a future Hall of Fame quarterback, sacked him, caused a fumble, and his best friend scooped up the ball and ran it 61 (laughs) yards for a touchdown. Can anybody do what you did to Peyton Manning your rookie year? Man, that's I, I have like several pictures from that play on my computer too, so they're always fun to look back on. But I think one player that can do that, and he has the position to do it, and his name is eerily similar to mine. Like I was calling him Claiborne Chase on for a while, even though it's Caleb on Chase on. But I mean, that man is a beast from LSU. I mean, he's an edge rusher who's built a little bit smaller. But he reminds me of another LSU rusher, Daniil Hunter, that came out who was a little bit slight of build, was a little bit underrated coming out, but then he just grew to become a monster up there in Minnesota. And so I feel like Caleb Von Chason could have like a similar impact for a team coming up in this year's draft. Tell me about that sack on Peyton Manning. Was that your signature play? Did you ever have a moment that topped that? Well, I picked off Peyton. Actually, my signature play for me personally was even though we lost the game, it was the AFC championship game my rookie year. And 
the Raiders were driving down into our end zone and I was able to lay a hit on Jerry Rice, like pretty much knocked him out. He fumbled the ball. Unfortunately, like he was able to like recover it too. I believe they went in and scored, but being able to hit my favorite player of all time and put a good lick on a lick that you can't do in the NFL these days, <laughs> pretty special memory to me. But when you're a rookie, that early part of your career, you're just trying to figure out like if you can make plays and if you if you belong, if you can have the same impact you could at the college level. And I believe that play in Indianapolis was like my first big splash play where I was like, okay, I could play with these dudes. I made a play on one of the best players in the league right now. And I believe I started to gain a lot of confidence from that point moving forward. That's good stuff. And, and you think about this too. I mean, it's been 18 years since you were drafted. Oh, and now you tell me that, Mike. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's been 18 years for me too, Tank. So, uh, but I mean, you think about this weekend and what it means, even though we're in the unusual circumstances that we are, the memories that this weekend will create, the memories that you have from 2002 being taken in the second round, looking at it from where you are now with a 30,000 foot view of your own life and your own career and being a Titan, tell us what it meant and what it means. I would say that draft day was probably one of the most special moments for me in my Titans career because it's one of those things where I guess a lot of people, players, like dream of playing in the NFL from like being a young kid, like always had a, a great love for the game. My dad was a football coach. I was just never like always the one that was the best one on the team or anything like that. So I never just dreamed from a young age I would play in the NFL. And so it was just grinding through junior high, high school, getting to college, becoming a really good player and then understand that, hey, I got a chance to get drafted. And then just sitting, like I had like my whole family at my primary residence where my parents live waiting for me to get drafted. And that was at my sister's house. And it was just myself and my parents were in the other room. And I remember just sitting in front of the TV and I got the call. And then I'm just so happy. And then my mom busts in the room like, oh, T, you got drafted. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> no. And so then getting off the phone with the Titans and being able to like celebrate with my intimate family first and then going and then celebrating with all my friends and family. I mean, it's one of those special memories. Like it's one of those things where a lot of plays and games kind of blend together. I don't remember like the specific details, but that day, that moment getting drafted is one thing that will always stand out to me and like I can remember it clear as, clear as yesterday. So good. Tell people how they can follow you on social media. On Twitter at TankWilliams13, on Instagram at TankWilliams13, on pretty much everything you can find at TankWilliams13. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, keep it seamless. So if you find me one place, you can find me everywhere. 13 was your number at Stanford, right? Yeah. Ah, because yeah. every Titans fan knows you as Tank Williams 25. 25. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amy Wells, tell people how they can follow you on social media. At Titans Amy, A-M-I-E. And of course, remember, the OTP is on and brought to you by our good friends at Farm Bureau Health Plans. And this has been a really special one for us to have one of our favorites, Tank Williams, with us as we leave. Do you have a message for Keith Bullock, who is a regular guest on the OTP? Uh, I always like to give Bull a hard time. I, I was just messing with him yesterday, actually. So <laughs> I don't have a really special message for him. But one thing I will say, since he's a regular on the show, you need to have me back one time when Bull is on the show. So we can Yes, do, 100%. We had a radio show back in the day. I think it was on like maybe 94.5 or something like that. And we used to have some really good times on the radio. So we can relive one of those moments on the show. That would be great. So let's make that happen. That's just my way of saying y'all need to have me back. <laughs> we'll have you back. Will, will you tell stories from your trips through Europe with Bullock? Oh, yeah. We got a lot of stories. A lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Enjoy draft weekend, old friend. Thank you for being with us. Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. For Tank Williams and Amy Wells, Mike Keith says thanks for joining us for the official Titans podcast presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. This has been the OTP.